for questions. The next item of business is a statement by Derek Mackay on response to the autumn statement. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no interruptions or interventions. And I would ask members who wish to speak in this statement to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Derek Mackay. Presiding officer, I would like to take this opportunity to respond to the autumn statement delivered by the Chancellor last week and to set out the implications it will have for Scotland's public finances and wider economy. The autumn statement and the accompanying analysis from the Office for Budget Responsibility starkly highlighted the detrimental impact that Brexit and the UK government's approach to the negotiations is having on the economy and the UK's public finances. The Scottish economy demonstrated its underlying resilience prior to the EU referendum in the face of considerable external headwinds. GDP grew by 0.4% in the second quarter of this year. Wages grew in real terms over the past year, and the labour market has continued to strengthen. The most recent labour market data shows that the unemployment rate has now fallen to 4.7%, the lowest rate since 2008 and below that of the UK. The number of people in employment in Scotland has also increased by over 166,000 since 2010. The Scottish economy is therefore well placed to face the challenges which are likely to emerge over the coming year. However, it is clear that Brexit has significantly increased economic uncertainty and has damaged business confidence and investment intentions. The forecasts set out by the OBR anticipate that Brexit will lead to investment being postponed or cancelled, higher inflation squeezing household real incomes and reduced trade with the EU. This in turn is expected to lead to lower economic growth, lower wages and lower tax revenues and in turn higher borrowing and debt. As a result of lower growth, the OBR now forecasts that the borrowing over the next five years will be over £110 billion higher than forecast in March, with the OBR attributing £59 billion of this increase solely to Brexit. And it is clear that the deteriorating outlook for the UK economy and the UK government's austerity policies will hit low-income families hardest. Analysis by the Institute for Fiscal Studies shows that as a result of Brexit reducing growth and increasing inflation, by 2021, average real wages will still be lower than they were in 2008. That implies 13 years without any growth in real wages, the longest period of stagnant wages since World War II. Presiding officer, the true cost of Brexit has been laid bare by this Tory Chancellor. And as our nation continues to debate our constitutional future, the choice we face is becoming clearer. If we are stuck with the hard right, hard Brexit of the Tories, we face lower growth, more borrowing, higher debt and higher inflation hitting hard-pressed families. That is one future Scotland now faces and I believe we must build a different future and we must give Scotland a different choice. In the face of a deteriorating economic outlook, the Chancellor had a choice to make on fiscal policy. He had the opportunity to take a fresh approach and to abandon his predecessor's rigid adherence to austerity. However, despite the rhetoric of resetting fiscal policy under the Chancellor's plans, Scotland will continue to see a real terms cut to the funding that it receives to pay for public services. By 2019-20, the Scottish Government's discretionary budget, Fiscal Dell, is expected to be more than 9% lower in real terms than it was in 2010-11. Reducing the scope we have to mitigate Westminster austerity and invest in growing in our economy. And this is before we see the impact of £3.5 billion of additional and so far unallocated cuts that the Chancellor has confirmed he plans to impose by 2019 20. The Chancellor announced some welcome capital investment in the autumn statement, which will provide consequentials for Scotland 
and we will use every penny available to us to invest in supporting our economy. However, again, this is simply moderating the cuts which have been already imposed upon the Scottish budget. Scotland's capital budget will still be around 8% lower in real terms in 2019-20 than it was prior to the start of the UK government's austerity programme. Despite this, in contrast to the silence and inaction of the UK government, we've already taken swift action in the wake of Brexit to support the economy by bringing forward an additional £100 million of capital investment. We are working hard to secure Scotland's continued relationship with Europe and we've already set out plans for a £500 million Scottish growth scheme to support Scottish business. Where the UK government last week failed to adjust the economic policy for the impact of Brexit, this government is using every lever at our disposal to protect Scotland's economy. And let us also be clear where the Chancellor failed to act as to protect Scotland's economy. Last week's statement failed once again to offer support to our North Sea oil and gas industry. Support for exploration would help secure future investment and the Chancellor chose not to make that support available and I will be raising this with him when I meet him tomorrow. Presiding officer, I will also be raising what is perhaps the most concerning aspect of the autumn statement, the lack of measures to help low income households. Instead of supporting households in the face of deteriorating economic outlook, the policies being pursued by the Westminster government are exacerbating the situation. The reforms to tax and social security being implemented by the UK government are highly regressive and the limited support provided in the autumn statement is dwarfed by the social security cuts which have already been announced. For example, the Resolution Foundation estimate that as a result of the changes to the economic outlook and policy measures being implemented during this parliament, a dual earning family with three children on low incomes will be £3,650 a year, worse off by 2020. Likewise, it estimates that a lone parent working part-time on the national living wage could be £2,640 a year, worse off. That is equivalent to an 18% cut in their household income. Virtually all households would struggle in the face of an 18% cut to their income. However, for households who are already dealing with rising bills, and have little spare income, a cut on this scale is simply unacceptable. Hardworking families should not have to pick up the tab of the UK government's austerity policies or their decision to leave the EU. Scotland did not vote for Brexit, yet this renewed economic squeeze is going to hit families here, many of whom are already struggling to make ends meet. And despite these cuts, the UK government is pressing on with its policy of giving the top 10% of the adult population a significant tax cut by raising the higher rate threshold. So there we have the Tories in a nutshell. The lowest income families are hammered whilst the better off are given tax cuts. Presiding officer, this government is taking a different approach to growing our economy and building a more equal society. We will set out the full details of our income tax policy in the draft budget on the 15th of December, but I can confirm today that we will use our tax powers to set Scotland on a fairer, more progressive path than the one chartered by the Tories. Let me be crystal clear, this is not the time to give large tax cuts for those on the highest incomes. We will maintain our commitment to support people in Scotland affected by the UK government's cuts to Social Security via the Scottish Welfare Fund, mitigating the bedroom tax and through the Council Tax Reduction Scheme. When we gain powers over £2.7 billion of Social Security spending in 2018-19, we will seize the opportunity to improve the support people receive where possible. In two weeks, I will bring forward my draft budget proposals and unlike the missed opportunities in the UK government's autumn statement, we will ensure our proposals support our economy, tackle the inequalities in our society, and protect high quality public services for all. We are a government for all of our people and I'll bring forward a budget for everyone. In the draft budget, we'll build on the actions we have taken by delivering the ambitious infrastructure investment programme set out in the programme for government, including significant investments in affordable housing, digital, energy efficiency, transport and health. 
We will take the first steps in our commitment to further expand early learning and childcare to 1,140 hours a year and increasing funding for the NHS over the life of this parliament. We will protect the police resource budget in real terms whilst providing direct funding to schools to improve attainment. We will continue to mitigate the worst impacts of UK austerity and build a social security system based upon dignity and respect. And I therefore look forward to setting out our budget proposals on the 15th of December. Thank you. Move straight to questions. Question number one from Murda Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I uh, thank, as is customary, the Cabinet Secretary for uh, the advanced copy? But what a dismal statement we've just heard from him. One would not think that the UK economy was the fastest growing economy in the G7 and projected to continue to grow strongly and with economic performance already well ahead of the dire predictions we heard prior to the Brexit vote. A vote, I would gently remind him, was supported by at least some of those on the benches behind him. What well, the autumn statement delivered was an increase in personal allowance to £12,500 by April 2020, helping the low paid, benefiting 2.6 million Scots and lifting 113,000 people out of tax altogether. There was no mention of that. There was no mention of the increase in the national living wage to £7.50 per hour. No mention of the freeze in fuel duty for the seventh successive year. No mention of the extra £2 billion spending on research and development. No mention of the £3 million extra for Scottish charities. And no mention at all of the city deal for Stirling and Clackmannanshire, which we were celebrating last night in this very building. The Cabinet Secretary talks about cuts. What Spice have told us is that in 2017-18, the Scottish Government's budget will be up in both revenue and capital, a total of, of £140 million in real terms over the current year. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that analysis? And if so, can he explain how a £140 million increase in budget amounts to a cut? And secondly, the Cabinet Secretary has signalled again that this SNP government intends to make Scotland the highest tax part of the United Kingdom. How does he expect our economy and our tax revenues to grow if he sends out a signal that Scotland is a country where, if you are successful, we will penalise you? Cabinet Secretary. On the, uh, first of all, maybe when the Chancellor meets me tomorrow, I don't know that I will improve his mood, but many Conservatives in the uh, House of Commons described the Chancellor uh, as fairly miserable. And I suppose that's because he's looking at the financial assessments that he's been given on the state of the economy as a consequence of the Brexit decision. But, you know, not just the Brexit decision, but the appalling handling of the UK government in negotiations uh, and the position, and even, even the OBR has said they're none the wiser as to the government's position. In terms of you know, Scotland voting to remain, as Murdo Fraser knows, 62% of those who voted voted to remain, and that should be respected uh, by the UK government. And politics is about choices. Murdo Fraser raises tax, and we believe it is the wrong choice at this time to give a tax cut uh, to the richest in our society. The only tax rate that changed under the UK government was the additional rate. So it's a typical Tory approach to hammer the less well off and reward the richest in our society with tax cuts. And that is not a choice that this government supports. And that's the proposition we put forward to the people of Scotland when we won the Scottish Parliament elections uh, earlier on this year. And in terms of the budget position, I welcome the fact that there is certainly some capital stimulus. We have been calling for it for some time, and I welcome the fact that our budget wasn't opened negatively. So I have given a welcome around that. But even with the uh, increase in figures from the Barnet consequentials, for one year, a marginal increase in real terms for resource for one year doesn't undo the 9% reduction over a 10-year period that the Tories have uh, bestowed upon Scotland. So we aren't the, the Conservatives aren't the generous overlords giving us fantastic new resources. They're simply giving us some resources back that have been taken away over a consistent and sustained period that's damaged so many parts of our uh, society. So we'll make the right choices on the 15th of uh, December, but that will not include uh, a tax cut for the richest in our society at this time. Kezia Dugdale. 
Thank you, President Officer. Last week's autumn statement showed us that the old Tory mantra of cut, cut and cut again still holds. Mm. The Chancellor confirmed the same cuts to public spending remain in place, cuts which will put at risk the life chances of people who just want to get on in life. But, Presiding Officer, today the new tax powers devolved to this Parliament mean that we can do things differently and we should use the powers of this place to stop the cuts and invest in schools and our local services. I agreed with the Finance Secretary when he said this is not the time to give large tax cuts for those on the highest incomes. It was, of course, Scottish Labour who first made the case not to pass on the increase in the threshold for middle earners last October. But we should go further too and ask those with the broadest shoulders not just to forgo their tax cut, but to pay their fair share. So when he's faced with the prospect of the swinging cuts he's about to make, why won't he ask those earning over £150,000 a year to pay a 50p top rate of tax? Cabinet Secretary. As Kezia Dugdale is well aware, it, it's not our position to simply pass on the pain of austerity to individual taxpayers through a basic rate increase. But on the additional rate uh, increase, our analysis showed that it might end up costing the Scottish Government money. Now, in that scenario, in that scenario then it would be counterproductive to raise tax to the point that we have less resource. However, our tax position, our tax position will remain under review, but we've set out in the manifesto what we propose to do around tax, which will ensure that Scotland is an attractive place to live and to do business, but we will deliver a package on taxation that is fair and balanced to individual households and taxpayers and also invest in quality public services. And that is a divergence from the proposition uh, from uh, the Conservatives. But of course, we'll continue to engage uh, with uh, society on that and our proposition around uh, council tax will also raise resources for quality services. So we'll make sure that we get the balance right on the proposition uh, that we presented to the people. Thank you. We move to open questions and uh, short questions, shorter answers too, please. Bruce Crawford to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. We've heard all the posturing attempts by the Tories to put the best spin possible in frankly chaotic public finances. But let's cut to the chase. What will be the longer term real increase a decrease sorry, in the Scottish budget as a result of the announcements made in the autumn statement, and how damaging will these be to public services? Cameron Secretary. The figure I, I've given uh, is accurate. That's a 9% reduction in the government's overall discretionary uh, spend over the period of uh, a decade, and this will continue to be challenging, particularly around resource for protecting frontline services, but we'll do our best uh, to, to achieve protection of those public services with our very balanced approach, but it is a 9% reduction in the government's overall discretionary budget spend. Dean Lockhart to be followed by Marie Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me start by welcoming the new city deal for Stirling. The autumn statement provides us with a timely comparison of the state of the UK economy under a Conservative government and the state of the Scottish economy under the SNP. 2.1% growth in the UK economy compared to SNP growth of just 0.7% in Scotland. A UK budget deficit of 4% of GDP declining to 1% compared to an SNP notional deficit of 9% of GDP. Productivity in the UK in the second quartile, uh, quart, uh, productivity in, in Scotland under the SNP in the third quartile, and Scotland seeing the lowest growth in employment rates of any region in the UK under this SNP government. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain what steps he will be taking to address this increasing underperformance of the Scottish economy? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, De Dean Lockhart would be wise to, to look at some of the underlying issues in the Scottish economy, and a major challenge for us has been around oil and gas. I'd be surprised if the Conservatives weren't aware of the pressures there. And much of the economic levers around that and other parts of our economic policy still rest with the UK government. And the UK government has to take some responsibility for the economy of Scotland eh, as well. And on oil and gas, this government specifically asked for interventions eh, that would assist in that area in terms of uh, investment and support. And there was nothing in the Chancellor's statement to support the oil and gas sector in Scotland, an issue that will certainly raise uh, tomorrow. Now, there is good news in terms of oil and gas uh, revenues and the forecasts uh, around that, but much more could have been done 
uh, to support that particular sector. But on the positive steps around uh, city deals, this government's worked very constructively with local authorities and the UK government around city deals and will continue to do so. We're recalibrating our economic policy, focusing on export opportunities in other areas as well as already outlined by the Economy Secretary and the First Minister. And we will do even more to support our economy, such as through the Scottish Growth Scheme, where we want to support private sector entrepreneurs' growth as well. So there are a range of actions that we are undertaking to support Scotland's economy. But I'm sure it won't be lost in the Chamber that right now the greatest threat to Scotland's economy is Brexit and the mishandling by this UK government in terms of membership, access to the uh, single market. And I think the UK government should take that issue far more seriously and uh, uh, certainly become uh, far more mature in their engagements with the European Union so that we can remove some of the uh, uncertainty and volatility that's certainly impacting on the economy, as explained even by your own Chancellor. Marie Todd, to be followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this autumn statement illustrates the gulf between the political rhetoric and the reality from the Conservative Party. Theresa May promised just last month to confront social injustice and said the Conservatives were now the party of workers, the party of public servants, the party of the NHS. But this wasn't evident in this statement. There was no mention of the NHS. And in fact, we learned a great deal more about just how badly hit the most vulnerable in our society will be. And indeed, many working families will be by wage freezes, welfare cuts and rising inflation. Cabinet Secretary. A, a analysis of, of the issue, but one element that Marie Todd was of course able to, to touch upon is remember during the referendum uh, on the EU, people were told that it would be £350 million uh, extra for the NHS, not a penny announced by the Chancellor in terms of new resources for the NHS, another part of the uh, sham around the EU uh, vote. Uh, but this government will continue to protect the NHS, will continue to support low-income households through the range of measures that we've currently got. But yes, the, the Tory Chancellor has failed to reset economic uh, policy and end austerity in the way that many of his colleagues were suggesting. Neil Bibby, be followed by Patrick Harvey. The Finance Secretary has welcomed the capital investment in the autumn statement and has said he will use every penny available to support our economy. Given the link between economic growth and our future revenues, it is imperative that every penny of capital spend is invested wisely. Can the Finance Secretary tell us what areas of capital spend he will prioritise for new projects to boost economic growth? And in the interest of transparency, when he publishes his budget, will he commit to providing the Parliament with information on what the Scottish Government believes the economic impact will be of each of those projects, particularly in relation to job creation? Cabinet Secretary. I, I think it's a fair attempt from Neil Bibby, and it was a fair question uh, and a good point around capital investment, how it connects to economic growth. I certainly agree with that point. Um, but I'm sure you, in asking the question, won't seriously expect me to preview the budget. Uh, but I think I was able to outline in part, I was able to outline in part in my opening statement some of the areas that are important to government, which have also featured in the programme for government as well. Uh, for example, uh, around uh, housing and infrastructure wouldn't be a surprise uh, to uh, the Chamber. In terms of value for money analysis, some of that work is undertaking some of the economic return as well. So I'll reflect on the point about how we could maybe provide analysis about investment in a capital programme and what we think the return on that is. That's a reasonable request and I'll reflect upon that. But of course, some of that will be around uh, particular assumptions uh, and modelling, but I think it's a very fair question, which helps make decisions around the uh, budget process and what, uh, cap where capital investment should be uh, targeted. But there will be a range of considerations on that, and I hope that's a helpful answer. I draw in short questions, short answers. Patrick Harvey to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the advanced copy of the statement. I was interested that it cited the work of the Resolution Foundation. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with their analysis that it's not just wider tax and benefit changes, but also the change to the personal al allowance by the UK Government, which is deeply regressive? The bulk of the benefit from that particular change goes to the richest half of households, and the poorest save virtually nothing. And does he agree that the Scottish Government is going to have to go beyond its manifesto commitments on tax if we intend to reverse the deeply regressive nature of UK Government policies? 
Cabinet Secretary. Patrick Harvey is certainly right to identify that when you look at the package of changes in the round that the Conservative Government are proposing, people that are less well off. There's no doubt about it, unless you're particularly well off uh, to start with. So I do think you have to look at the totality of tax and social security propositions to recognise the impact it's having on families. I know that the First Minister, and I've certainly said before, that we'll continue to look at our tax uh, position and look at the transfer of powers uh, coming to Scotland to make sure that we get the balance right to try and support low-income households. Uh, but we have a manifesto proposition that we want to adhere to, but I do think it's correct to say we'll have to look at all the different levers we've got to try and support uh, some of the, the less well-off at this time. And the Resolution Foundation has provided some very, very helpful work around the current position and the decisions by the UK Government, that sh which will require a further reflection. Mike Rumbles to be followed by Gil Patterson. Um, the Finance Secretary has more money available for next year as a result of the autumn statement, but what is his position with funding for our schools? Local authorities are not a protected budget line under the SNP government, so they're going to get hammered. Half of what they do is education. So how will he protect schools, given that this is a decision that falls to him as a result of the autumn statement? Cabinet Secretary. Of course, presiding officer there speaks that a man who voted against more money for education when we were uh, proposing uh, changes around uh, taxation. But I will, I will tell Mr Rumbles that I'm engaging with local government in talks around the financial settlement. And I believe that uh, I'll have a constructive relationship with local government and I'll be able to produce a budget that does prioritise uh, education. So it would be wrong to say that any uh, concerns have been dismissed. This is a government that said that education and addressing the attainment gap is a priority, and that will be seen through the Scottish budget. Gil Patterson to be followed by Liam Kerr. Many thanks, Presiding Officer. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the total lack of any plan for Brexit from the UK Government is continuing to threaten both the Scottish and UK economies and that the UK statement fails to mitigate this threat in any way? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, to be concise, presiding officer, because I know we're short of time, yes, I do share that concern. I think the UK government is acting uh, in a reckless way and it's impacting on the UK and the Scottish economy. Liam Kerr to be followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you, presiding officer. The Cabinet Secretary brings up oil and gas in his statement and some of his answers. Now, industry body Oil & Gas UK has said that the UK continental shelf is now the most fiscally competitive in the world, thanks to changes brought in by the Conservative government. Last week, the Chief Executive of Oil & Gas UK said, and I quote, we are pleased with the autumn statement. Why are Oil & Gas UK wrong and the Cabinet Secretary right? Cabinet Secretary. I think, I think Liam Kerr should be aware of the additional requests around support for decommissioning, tax incentives and further exploration. Now, this is further actions that the Chancellor could take to support oil and gas in the north-east of Scotland. And I'm very surprised uh, that the Conservatives seem to think that they've never had it so good and more cannot be done, that more cannot be, gun, be done uh, to support that particular uh, sector. So I know that these are measures that I've asked the Chancellor for that has the support for the sector. Maybe the Scottish Conservatives should join us to try and support that sector even further. Gillian Martin to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that this failure to address oil and gas industry pressures leaves the Scottish Government again in a position where we can only attempt to mitigate the effects of their cavalier attitude to this important component of the Scottish economy? And isn't it time the Scottish Government had the fiscal powers devolved so that they could do the job properly? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> we, we have been, uh, as a government, in a position to support uh, some people through swift actions uh, around council tax reduction, uh, the welfare fund and how we tackled uh, the bedroom tax. But of course, if we had more fiscal levers, we could do even more. And some of the changes that even the UK government have undertaken in the autumn statement does dwarf the overall changes to social security uh, that are hammering some of the less well-off and more vulnerable in our society. Jackie Bailey, to be followed by Kate Forbes.
The Cabinet Secretary painted a very complacent picture of the Scottish economy, but the truth is that GDP has been falling in every quarter since the start of 2015 and is consistently worse than GDP for the rest of the UK. With downward revisions to growth forecast for the future, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that one of the best investments he can make to grow the economy is to invest in education? And on that basis, can he explain to the Chamber why he is not committing to providing a real terms increase in education? Spending. Cabinet Secretary. Well, again, I won't, I won't preview the Scottish budget on the 15th of December, but I've made it clear that education is a priority. I continue to work uh, with local authorities, and of course, it is the case uh, that we want to uh, target uh, attainment and the uh, inequality gap uh, in attainment, and I hope that we will continue to have the support of the Labour Party to do that. Kate Forbes. The Cabinet Secretary's direct response to third sector groups and churches who slammed the autumn statement for offering little hope as measures went nowhere near far enough to reversing cuts already made. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I concur with a number of those comments. Now, just point out to, to people in the chamber around work from the Resolution at Foundation, which showed that tax and welfare reforms being introduced by the UK Government during this Parliament are highly regressive with those at the bottom of the income distribution seeing the largest losses in both cash terms and as a share of their incomes. That's the reality of the UK, UK government's changes. Now, I know the Tories are silent at this point, but I can't understand why the Labour Party are objecting to that commentary from the Resolution Foundation, because I think it does highlight some of the terrible impacts that will be as a consequence of this right-wing Chancellor's decisions eh, on Scotland and the UK. 